It's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Sam Gaunt, Senior Scientist and Cultural Advisor at the Nature Conservancy. Born and raised in Hawaii, Dr. Gaunt received his bachelor's degree in zoology here at University of Hawaii Manoa. He received his master's degree and doctorate in animal behavior at the University of California, Davis. Dr. Gaunt has over 35 years of experience in Hawaiian ecology. It includes um, experience in biological inventories and research, field ecology, entomology, ethology, ecological modeling, and biological database management. He is also versed in Hawaiian culture, history, and language. He's applied his island conservation expertise in cooperative projects and workshops in the Galapagos, the Philippines, Pompeii, Palau, Jamaica, Okinawa, uh, the Amazon, and Rapa Nui. He's presented on Hawaiian ecosystems and culture at the Smithsonian Museum, um, and recently was invited to present on his work in Berlin and Paris. He gave a tremendous TED Talk last year, uh, Lessons from a Thousand Years of Island Sustainability. He has a particular fondness, Dr. Gan does, for trilobites, native Hawaiian plants, happy face spiders, and posting photos of delicious meals on Facebook. <laughs> He served on the Office of Hawaiian Affairs, the Board of Trustees for the Native Hawaiian Culture and Arts Program, the Bishop Museum Association Council, the State Board of Land and Natural Resources, and if that's not enough, Dr. Gon has um, been confirmed to sit on the State Endangered Species Recovery Committee. Um, and even more recently on the IUCN World Conservation Conference Organizing Committee. Um, last year, Dr. Gon joined the Hukulea uh, and Aotearoa in their uh, educational efforts. Uh, for over 12 years, Dr. Gan studied Oli, traditional Hawaiian chants, and hula with Kumu John Lake, a master of Hawaiian religion and cultural protocol. He was initiated in 2003 as a kahuna kaka la leo, a practitioner of Hawaiian chant and protocol. Uh, for his contributions to conservation biology and Hawaiian cultural practice, Dr. Gan was honored by the Honpa Hangwanji Mission of Hawaii with the designation of Living Treasure of Hawaii. We certainly agree and wish to welcome and thank him for making the time to join us today. So, in his text, Kamo'o Olelo Hawaii, 19th century Kanaka intellectual Kepelino wrote this. He wrote, Ahukupanaha ia Hawaii imi loa, enoi iwale no kahaulea, aole pau nahana Hawaii imi loa. So he said, a heap of amazing things can be learned about Hawaii, and however diligently the foreigner inquires, he cannot fathom all of the doings of far-seeking Hawaiians. So the presentation on Hawaiian science, Ikeo Kapoke Imi Loa, Knowledge of a Far-Seeking People, is inspired by Capolino's characterization of Hawaiian knowledge as Imi Loa, as far-seeking. Does anybody see the, see the shark by the Kamohoaniki in this?
So this only this chant for enlightenment is full of imagery, imagery of biology and the EO, the Hawaiian heart, <laughs> images of place as in Hakalau on the northeast coast of, I mean, uh, flank of Mauna Kea. Images of meteorology and the winds, thunder, and lightning. Images of governance and leadership. Images of religion and Udi, the goddess of resuscitation. Images of history in the, uh, in the evocation of the phrase Kealu Akune Kapune, which is the, reminds you of the story of several different kahuna who were challenging a particular powerful priest who lived in Hakalau and could not defeat him individually, so they combined their, their pule um, toward him and were successful there. And all of these images are wielded toward the goal of enlightenment. It's intended to put you into a framework where you take many threads and concepts and create a balanced result. It hints at the way that Hawaiian knowledge and learning is not only a matter of intellect, but also of practical skill, knowledge, and spiritual growth. Kaloea, kaike, kamana. A parallel to the idea of the holistic being as mature physically, mentally, and spiritually. And there also um, are whole ailona in this chant, signs, signs of uncertainty, uh, searching, of the flash of insight, and of the weighty consequences of decisions based on knowledge. All of that was in that chant, an awesome one. But before we go further, I want to acknowledge my training in dual worlds. I'm Western trained as a conservation biologist. I've earned my bachelor's degree here at UH Zoology, as was mentioned, before earning my master's in zoology and my PhD in ethology, the study of animal behavior. And I studied the behavior, ecology, and evolution of the Hawaiian happy face spider, and at the same time, its role in native Hawaiian forest habitats. I've seen firsthand uh, perhaps more native Hawaiian plants and animals in my work as an ecologist with the Nature Conservancy of Hawaii than most kanaka see in a few lifetimes. And I make it my duty to these native species to know their names and their status on all of the islands. But I owe my Ike Hawaii and my Na'au Hawaii, my traditional knowledge and intuition, to many kumu, but including some respected individuals um, that are from end to end of this archipelago. But the one who I sat with for the last dozen years and whom, from whom I learned all the Hawaiian chant and protocol, and who put me through the uniki hu elepo to emerge as a practitioner of all the protocol, a kahuna ka kalaleo. That one is Kumujan, Kiola Makaina, Na Kalahu Yokalani, O Kamehameha, Ikolu Lake, shown here leading us in chants to Queen Ili Uokalani's birthday at Yolani Palace a number of years ago. But this time I have with you today is to discuss Hawaiian science. What is it? What distinguishes it? Why should you understand it, besides the fact that some of the information here might appear in an exam sometime? Um, <laughs> let's start with some recent views of the relationship between science and Hawaiian culture. Recently, there's been um, some ostensibly polar interactions between science and Hawaiian communities. It gives the impression that Hawaiian culture has very little to do with science. But we should, ex we should examine this a little bit more closely. Science is a process. Um, oh yeah, here are some of the arguments that you might hear in the press. But science is a process not restricted to Western civilization, and Ike Hawaii, traditional Hawaiian knowledge, can provide value to our modern endeavors. If we're to explore the interaction of science and culture in today's context, we need to start with definitions. And once defined, it's pretty straightforward. Um, what is science? Science is an approach to learning, and it's marked by empiricism and observation, by manipulation of conditions and experimentation, by prediction and modeling, and by testing and replication. So-called proof, even though we know if you study uh, scientific method, that it's not a matter of proof. It's a matter of resistance to disproof. And finally, transmission of that knowledge. So it should be clear that many elements of a traditional Hawaiian approach are quite consistent with what would be called a scientific approach. Hawaiian traditional knowledge was empirical and was based on repeated observations of phenomenon in the world, uh, phenomena in the world, land, sea, and sky, bent on detecting and expressing correlations and testing predictions and consequences. Many olelo no eao, that is uh, wise or poetical sayings, um, take on the form of correlative statements 
as in the following examples. Um, the matching of seasonal phenomena of land and sea is a hallmark of Hawaiian knowledge systems. Pua ka wili wili na nahu ka mano. The wili wili blooms, the shark bites. The blooming season for wili wili is at the end of the kawela, the hot season, and before the rains of the ho'ilo, the wet season. Um, this matches peak aggregations of sharks in shallow waters called lala ni kalaleo, the rows of protruding fins that occur at the same time. The practical consequence of prediction of shark behavior through a land phenomenon blooming of a particular plant is pretty obvious. Long before you enter the water, you know to be watchful for the sharks. Or how about this observed correlation? Pua ke ko kumai kaheke. The sugarcane are blooming, the octopus are appearing. So in Hawaii, ko blooms at the start of the ho'oilo, around November, ko is sugarcane. Um, this correlates with the peak abundance period of mature hepe, octopus, on the, root, on the reefs. So recall that octopus come into maturity within a year and live, live in general no longer than about 18 months. So this means that for any year, um, seasonality in mating creates cohorts that are planktonic and of very small size during at least half of the year. When they reach an edible size, they would rather suddenly make their appearance to observant reef fishers who made this initial correlative observation. Or this equally famous correlation, pala kahala momona kavana. The hala fruit are ripe, the sea urchins are fat with eggs. And if you enjoy ha uke uke um, sea urchins, these guys, as much as I do, you start to ono for them when the ripe, fragrant fruit of the hala are falling from the trees. So this kind of seasonal correlation statement is the product of centuries of generational corroboration of older observations. But for how many more generations will these olelo no eao continue to hold true if global climate changes occur on land and sea that shift one or both of the cycles of the creatures involved? The perspective of the imiloa is that broken correlations will fade and that new correlations will be observed, suggested, and tested as they always have been. In fact, the classic Olelo no Ea will remind us as historical observations of times when the world behaved differently. Going back to the Willy Willy and the sharks, the utility of this Olelo no Ea goes far beyond the empirical observation of a natural correlation. The meaning of this saying depends on the context in which it's said. When something beautiful and desirable appears, even in modern society, um, someone might say, ah, the sharks are circling already. You know, whether it's that parking space that you're vacating, uh, the last piece of Maui Manju on the plate being eyed by you and your friends, uh, or that beautiful woman surrounded by suitors. Kauna is a term for secondary contextual meanings and is a major part of Hawaiian communication. The hidden meaning in Hawaiian statements is called kauna and lies at the heart of Hawaiian wisdom and interpretation of Olelo no Ea. Natural phenomena in ancient Hawaii were often characterized as kino lau, as physical manifestations of akua, or deities. For example, lono was seen as the akua of the winter rains and presided over the seasonal cultivation of uala, sweet potato, and of ipu, gourd, in the drier arable lands. The season of lono is the ho'oilo, the Hawaiian winter or wet season, and is marked by the makahiki, the start of the traditional uh, Hawaiian year. Some people would say the end of the traditional Hawaiian year as well. Only during this time of year was cultivation of the rain-dependent crops of the leeward drylands possible, and sometimes the window for cultivation was very narrow. Many of the heiau servicing agriculture in such zones were dedicated to lono, and were heiau ho'olu'ua, that is, temples where prayers were directed to bring rain. Um, some of the chants to lono directly indicate the, cor uh, the connection between that major Hawaiian god and the meteorology of winter, for example, through the evocation of clouds. With such chants, the kahuna could evoke rain as needed, for example, in famine times. So here's one of those chants to start with them. So 
So, so important are these cloud signs in the heavens that when you consult traditional Hawaiian sources, there are hundreds of names of cloud forms, clouds that prognosticate the coming weather and which were studied intently and named. Here are a few examples. The Aupua'a, the Aoloa, the Aumanu, the Aueliopula, the Aoonipo, the Aopukulima, all at their simplest level, visual features in the heavens formed of condensed water. But when combined with traditional knowledge systems, they are important ho'ailona, important indications of times to plant, times to avoid oceanic voyaging, times to prepare offerings to the fishing gods, times to set medicinal herbs to dry, times to store water. Sometimes attention to these ho'ailona made the difference between life and death. But as much attention that was paid to the more prominent kinolao of the Okua in their realm, it must be pointed out that in the Hawaiian perspective, all of the thousands of living denizens of the Wawakua are also considered manifestations of the gods, and that, uh, and as such, can hold huge significance that belies their physical stature. Take the tiny fern, Shizea robusta, that bears the name Oali'i Makali'i. It's easy to completely disregard this fern. It grows inconspicuously among the mosses and seedlings on the forest floor high in the mountains. Uh, but there's a chant to Lono that in the very first line links this fern to the, that deity of the winter wet season, um, uh, the Ho'oilo. It's like, Elono ita oali'i, Elono udimo, Elono udilani, and on and on and on. So, Lono ita oali'i, Lono in this fern. So the chant establishes a connection of this fern to Lono, but if you're familiar with the traditions of Lono, you know that he's the god presiding over the Makahiki season, the celebration of the fertility of the land and the promise of the bounty of the new year. And does anyone know the astronomical ho'ailona of the advent of the makahiki season? What is the sign in the heavens that says the makahiki has come? Hmm. Nobody wants to blurt it out, or does anybody know? So the sign of the, of the makahiki season is when the constellation called the Seven Sisters, or the Pleiades, rises at sunset. Then the Makahiki begins. And the Hawaiian name of the Pleiades is a Makaliki. So the Oali'i Makaliki is then the Kinolau of Lonoika Makahiki. So no coincidence that this fern matures and becomes thick and full of golden brown spores during the Makahiki season. Kinolau uh, assignments were complex, and they were based upon the context of symbolic natural phenomena. There were countless variations of natural phenomena, and not surprisingly, there were the Kiniakua, the 40,000 gods, each with names, personalities, and duties. Uh, in contrast, the Lonoku is the god of the hot summer season and of war and chiefly governance, but that simplified dichotomy does not suffice to characterize the many Kinolau of Ku. If Ku is the god of war, it might make sense that a koa tree itself sharing the name for a warrior might be among the kino love of Ku. But the red color that is symbolic of Ku can be found in the red lehua blossoms, the red of iivi feathers, but also the red of certain fish of the sea, such as the aveoveo. So Ku Ula, red Ku, is the main god of fishing, and the connection between fishing um, to the sky um, is seabirds. So another kino of Ku is the Hawaiian fairy tern called the Manu Oku, the bird of Ku. Unlike migratory seabirds such as the Moli or albatross and the Kolea or the plover, uh, which appear only in winter and were therefore the Kino of Lono, Manu Oku are residents year long and their flocks wheeling above the schools of fish were the guidance of Ku Ula to the Lawaita, the fishermen. Thus the behavior of elements of the universe were described in terms of the behavior of Kino Lao and themselves were expressions of the uncountable gods. So the Kinolau system is far more complex than this chart depicts, but the point of this chart is that between all of the Kinyakua, every season, every human activity, every food, and everything in the natural world would be represented. In this manner, all observations and connections of the world around you could be organized in terms of their presiding Akua. Notice crops versus other species and, and the dichotomy of the, of the different wild, the different realms that these gods represent. 
One thing that someone pointed out uh, recently is that Kane and Kanaloa as brothers, with Kane representing fresh water and Kanaloa the ocean, so salt water. Um, but fresh water runs over land and falls from the sky. And so between Kane and Kanaloa, you have sky, land, and ocean. So you have the entire physical uh, part of existence. Between Ku and Lono that divide the year between the hot summer months and the, and the wet winter months, you take the temporal. So you have in the four of the major gods here, the spatial temporal universe of ancient Hawaii. So moving on now to experimentation, modeling, and prediction. Um, that Hawaiians manipulated natural systems toward particular goals is well seen in the lokoi'a, the fish pond, uh, engineering and the design of lo'i, the agricultural terraces, and the awai, the irrigation canals. Biological manipulations such as hand pollination of plants with the express purpose of increasing seed set has also been documented. In fact, it was Mayenne, a French botanist visiting the islands in the 1800s, that wrote in his journal about encountering an Indian woman, that was his, those were his words, remember at the time, Indian, indigene, indigenous, um, we're all, we're all uh, being used um, in roughly that manner. So he encountered an Indian woman bent over a Hawaiian poppy, manipulating its flowers. So he asked her what she was doing, and she explained um, that by taking the ehu, the pollen, from one flower to another, she could increase the number of edible seeds produced. Now, man was astounded by this, by this glimpse of the intimate knowledge uh, and empirical science of Hawaiians in their living landscape. Estimates of the pre-contact population uh, in ancient Hawaii range from 200,000 to 800,000. And at the higher end, um, this rivals today's population densities and was entirely self-sufficient. Um, today, without our steady influx of imported foods and goods, we'd perhaps be eyeing each other hungrily in about three weeks. So the idea of manipulation that yield changes in conditions, that's a very Hawaiian thing. So recently, some colleagues and I published a paper on using GIS models to indicate the footprint of both wet lo'i and dry land fields in pre-contact Hawaii. I allude to a little bit of that in, in the TED talk. The paper examined the requirements of two of the major staple crops of Hawaii, kalo, taro, and uala, sweet potato, and filtered for the combinations of topographic, climatic, and soil conditions that provided for the highest potential of those two crops. For Kalo, the optimum combination is plentiful water, low elevation, warm setting, and gentle slope. And for Uala, the critical condition is winter rainfall, sufficient to support growth of the vines and tubers, but not so heavy as to leach nutrients from the soil. Um, older soils with less nutrients um, uh, uh, were uh, excluded from the model, and younger substrate age was an uh, important factor here. When we tested the model against actual archaeological complexes that related to the two crops, we saw remarkable congruence. It indicated that Hawaiians had developed many, if not all, of the areas of highest agricultural potential for Kalo and Uala. The Hawaiian model was to express not in a computer file, but across tens of thousands of acres of land, applied science at a landscape scale. So what you see here are uh, red is, is what the model suggested would be the sweet spot for growing uala, sweet potatoes. And the teal outline is the archaeological complexes that related to growing uala. And the same is true for blue, which was for kalo, and the light up outlines uh, being where the tarolobi, um, ancient tarolobi were located. Although in ancient Hawaii there might have been any, uh, there might not have been any formal publication of results to, in, to encourage replication of experiments, there was certainly oral transmission of knowledge and testing through practice. Any knowledge that could not be practically replicated or give inconsistent results would likely not be promulgated much further. These olelo no niao point to the need to verify that which is heard by a direct experience. Thus, in a very practical sense, Hawaiian knowledge depended on replicability of results, another hallmark of the scientific method. But if we accept that Hawaiian process, uh, Hawaiian learning process was scientific, what distinguishes Hawaiian science from Western science? 
There are a number of implied assumptions about Hawaiian versus Western approaches, especially with regard to worldview. Some of these are oversimplified here, but they serve to highlight the contrast. Where in a Western in a Western approach, land might be viewed as a commodity, or which one manipulates toward best use, and biological elements are often manipulated dramatically from wild form toward human-friendly domesticated forms, and people are hired labor to realize a scope of work. Plants and animals are objects to be reintroduced uh, or extracted from an island. Biological elements are separate from cultural elements on the landscape. Um, we see land as a conscious entity, and in fact, often uh, land as an ancient relative of, of the individuals on that land. We see ecosystems modified and often semi-wild with key ecological processes intact. People connected spiritually with place and contributing to and benefiting from that place. Plants and animals as conscious individuals and kino lao of gods requiring individual attention to thrive. And plants and animals, uh, oh, I already said that. Yeah, as conscious individuals and as sacred kino lao. So if we look at this further for with Koho Olave as an example, the owl is a low to middle priority element in the restoration of Koho Olave since it's not endemic to Koho Olave and it's not crucial to the revegetation. In, Hawaii, in the Hawaiian view, the poyo is a spiritual connection to an island otherwise made entirely unfamiliar by major land use changes and alien species invasions. Poyo is an auspicious and positive sign, so a Hawaiian botanist or a, or a Hawaiian archaeologist would be just as excited to see a poyo on the island as the zoologist. This is because the poyo is not only a biological feature but also a deeply cultural symbol. When we were working on the, the restoration plan for the island of Kaho'olawe, for example, I was undergoing training uh, in chant with Kumule, and he had taught us an early morning chant uh, to the Aumakua, to the ancestors. And um, while I was on island, we were sleeping at the barracks at Hanakanaipa, and even though the, the unexploded ordnance folks said, never go out at night by yourself, um, I, I violated that. And in pre-dawn, uh, semi-dark, I walked from the camp up to the top of the nearest hill so that I could practice that chant that Kumulik had, had taught me. And as I started to, to chant this chant, um, maybe within three or four lines of the chant, I started, I was wondering whether I was seeing things because I started seeing dark shapes move before my eye. Um, and it turned out to be not one, but four different pueo circling um, as I was chanting. It was everything that I could do to not stop um, the chant, but to complete it. Because one of the things that you were taught is that once the chant begins, the kapu is on you to complete the chant correctly. So I finished that body, and as I, as I stopped, the owls continued to circle for a while, and then their circles got larger and larger until you couldn't see them anymore. It was an awesome thing. And when I went, when I went back after that trip and told Kumulek about that experience, he just smiled. Because um, for Kumulek, the Pueo is among his family's Aumakua. So the tendency of Western approaches to separate um, natural resources and cultural resources is seen in the common practice of creating separate natural resource management plans versus cultural resource management plans. The Hawaiian approach of natural resources as cultural resources is reflected in the current trend to characterize biocultural resources. Western science has a reputation for being, quote, coldly objective, unquote, while Hawaiian knowledge is not divorced from emotion and is said to be guided from the gut. In truth, intuition and passion are critical to scientific inquiry in both Hawaiian and non-Hawaiian contexts. But the Hawaiian approach embraces intuition and feeling readily, while Western science approach uh, might view intuition as the least objective part of the process of inquiry and mistrusts decisions made on intuitive hunches alone. This is a key point in the perceived conflict between science and culture. But any respected and experienced cultural practitioner would accede that not all hunches are reliable and that the best intuitive guidance is based on long experience and a subconscious matching of options with what is known to be true. 
That is, what feels bono in the na'o, what feels correct in the gut, is what fits best with a lifetime of learning. It should also be pointed out that the, quote, objective approach um, can be a limitation of Western science when it allows for amoral or immoral scientific developments. Some of these have been of extreme disservice, disservice to humankind, and such a history accounts for much of the general public's current distrust of science. We sometimes see clear examples of Western science converging upon long-standing tenets of traditional Hawaiian knowledge. Hawaiians speak of the na'o, the guts, as the source of ideas and wisdom. And Western science long demeaned the quaint idea of the intestinal tract being the, quote, brains of Hawaiians. However, recently the findings of Michael Gershon, the author of the book, The Second Brain, demonstrated how the enteric nervous system relatively independent of brain spinal cord control, in fact provides powerful feedback on our behavior, creating a sense of unease when a decision is potentially wrong or dangerous. Gershon speaks of the enteric nervous system as a holdover from an ancient evolutionary past, while Hawaiians would speak of listening within to the guidance of the ancestors, mai kapo mai, that is, from the distant past. To balance the idea of Western and Hawaiian approaches as distinct, there are also many, many commonalities relevant to restoration approaches in this particular case, but these commonalities run broad and apply to other modern situations as well. Both Hawaiian and Western approaches recognize ecological zones, manipul manipulative experimentation, the importance of pest control, um, both engage in species transplantations. Importantly, both uh, rely on expert consultation. Both believe in the imposing and lifting of restrictions, and both express concern for the future of resources. Practical application of Hawaiian knowledge takes us beyond uh, shared practice um, and into modern management action. In the Hawaiian traditional skills for dry land planting, for example, are, are relevant to Kaho'olawe's restoration, attention to weather and seasonal climate, management of semi-wild ecosystems, well-developed agricultural protocols um, in uh, methods for propagation and growing, and specialized techniques for dry land, such as kuaibi rock mulch, uh, mulching. So interestingly enough, on Kaolabi, it's really dangerous to dig because you might run across very unexploded ordnance. And so much of the planting and soil development is done on the surface, which is exactly what rock mulching does. You place rocks um, perpendicular to the direction of the wind, and any organic material and soil blowing on the wind collects within those rocks, and you can begin to plant on the surface. And so it's a very interesting uh, method that is being used um, in various uh, ways on the island of Kahokalambe. Hawaiian knowledge extends to human interactions, coordination, and cooperation. Ho'oponopono is the Hawaiian science of dispute resolution. Central to Hawaiian life is the idea of the blending of material and spiritual. Success in life is, depend, is defined uh, by physical, moral, and spiritual growth. Traditional knowledge supports modern scientific endeavors. Before 1989, for example, the nesting colonies of the endangered Hawaiian petrel, the Uau'u, on Kauai were unknown to Western science. But according to the Mo'olelo of the island of Kauai, the story of Lauhaka, Lauhaka was the nephew of Kane Aloha and was trained to be a kiamanu, a bird catcher. He seasonally lived on the cliffs of Wainiha near Mauna Hina to wait for the Uau'u birds. That's the story. That was the story. It was the story of the Haleo Lauhaka, the house of Lauhaka. So in the summer of 1989, uh, we selected to camp at the Haleo, Haleo Lauhaka, essentially reoccupying the house of Lauhaka. And there we heard the night calls of the Uahu returning to their nests in the Uluhe covered cliffs there, confirming the oral tradition and demonstrating the value of those kinds of mo'olelo to modern endeavors. Another example comes out of the geological mapping of West Molokai. Um, so, Ayaki Anako'i Ikaluako'i. Akaluako'i is an ad quarry. So, the Ko'i, of course, was the major tool in ancient Hawaii. Uh, nearly everything that was built, koi boards, houses, uh, canoes, was made with the Ko'i. 
Uh, Kalua Koi is a place on the west end of Molokai, and its name harkens to the vitally important Koi resources to be found there. When the geological map of Molokai was first drafted by the famous geologist Harold Stearns, it was funded by the sugar planters whose primary motivation was water resources. So the water-rich East Molokai was extremely well mapped, while the West, while west Molokai uh, was treated as a simple, undifferentiated unit. Um, John Sinton, a uh, geology professor here at UH-101, now emeritus, I guess, uh, took on the task of mapping West Molokai. And what he found impressed him greatly. Uh, he was mapping camping lavas, which is a particular stage in the development of, of, a, of a volcano. You guys are familiar with that, having gone through the geology units here. Um, there were also um, smaller capping lava areas that included, uh, uh, that were mapped. And Everywhere he went, he found Hawaiians had established quarries in these capping lavas. Moreover, the highest quality adzes were to be found in a specific subset of the capping lavas, shown in darker blue, and every single example of this subtype he found was a particularly well-used quarry site. All this led Dr. Sinton to remark that Hawaiians were superb regional geologists, recognizing the shared characteristics of distinct exposures and applying this in their search for the sources of their primary tool. Hawaiian science resulted in some remarkable emergent patterns as well, especially in the realm of applied ecosystem services. When overlaying on the distribution of major eco ecological systems of ancient Oahu, the Ahupua'a uh, boundaries of Oahu show a remarkable distribution of resource areas from summit to ocean. So the boundaries of the Ahupua'a of Oahu are shown in black. And note in particular the convergence of Ahupua'a of the central leeward Ko'olau toward the hugely productive estuarine system of Pu'uloa, now largely destroyed by industrialization and pollution. It's not well known that Oahu and not Molokai had the largest numbers of ancient fish ponds, mostly lining the Avalau of Pu'uloa, the many locks of Pu'uloa that is now called Pearl Harbor. I mean, when you think about it, right? The largest waves would never affect these, these fish ponds. Um, they were always mixohaline, which is like ideal for certain food fish. Uh, surrounded by wetlands, so you could have your kalolobi right next door to your best fishing areas. It was like the star location for the island of Oahu, and what did we do to it? My gosh. Anyway. Ike Hawaii was off, uh, often requires a broad geographic knowledge for full understanding. This is because the Hawaiian concept of aina is made up of layers within layers. This allows a kanaka from anywhere in Hawaii to consider aina simultaneously as his pahale, his house lot, his ahupua'a, or land section, his moku, or district, his mokupuni, or island, his pai aina, or archipelago, and ultimately the way the honua, the whole world, affects what is happening right around him or her. So here's an example of this, uh, of this kind of place connection um, uh, that makes sense only when the concentric context is understood. So, Pu'umo'iwi uh, is an ad quarry on Kaho'olawe. Kaho'olawe is an ahupua'a of Honua Ula Moku of the island of Maui. Honua Ula is one of 12 moku of Maui Island. Maui is part of the Pai Aina of Hawaii. And Hawaii, at the time, was part of the larger uh, oceanic uh, connected um, nations of Polynesia. Kaho'olawe is a manifestation of Kanaloa, one of the four principal of Kua Hawaii, the god of seafaring. Kaopalave was a seafaring training site preparing navigators for voyaging between Hawaii and the rest of Polynesia. And so what ties this all together was that an ad from Pu'umo'ibi was recently found in the Tuamotu archipelago in an archaeological site there. So suddenly the, the contextual concept of, uh, of your aina being connected to the broader world around you is made clear. In December 2010, the Hawaii Conservation Alliance, an organization comprised of uh, the 25 agencies and organizations 
um, that are most responsible for conservation of Hawaii land and sea, ratified a position paper entitled Hawaiian Culture and Conservation in Hawaii, with a preamble that reads, in Hawaii, inter integration of Native Hawaiian approaches and knowledge systems with conventional conservation efforts is essential to achieve a vision of sustainable communities of people actively perpetuating thriving lands and seas through their management and restoration. The challenge for the future is how to train professionals in dual worlds so they can wield the best of both systems. Now, what would it take to wield Hawaiian science toward this vision? Um, in my view, three different things are needed. One, language skills. Hawaiian knowledge is transmitted using the subtleties of Hawaiian language. Two, firm grounding in Hawaiian natural history. So welcome to this class. And three, firm grasp of the traditional Hawaiian pre-contact and historical accounts. Because EK Hawaii was transmitted orally, much, of the, much was lost in the epidemics of the 1800s. And only the portions of Hawaiian knowledge that were shared by surviving families and by those scholars, including non-Hawaiian scholars, who took the time to render into writing that which was previously entirely orally transmitted, survived into modern times. So we stand on the, the edge of remarkable times, and I hope you all play a role in that. Mahalo. We can uh, take the lights up, and if anybody has any questions or, or comments, that would be awesome. Don't be stunned. <laughs> How did you determine that ads was from here? Um, there were a number of different ways to do that. Um, the way that uh, stones erode, um, there's a hydration rind that's formed around the, around the outside of the stone as, as weathering takes place. And different stones from different locations weather in a particular way. So if you can get a cross section, for example, in an ads, there's often breaking, and so you can see through the see through those hydration rind layers, um, and then you can compare the hydration rind signatures of different places. And that Tuamotu one had the very distinctive mark of the Pupumoivi um, ads that are also known from uh, many Hawaiian collections as well. In fact, it stood out so much that when that ads was first found in Tapu Tapu Ate, I believe. Um, the, the archaeologists um, there said, this is not a stone from here. Where is this stone from? And so that began the search, and it wound up on Kahoola. I mean, the answer wound up to Kahoola. So you brought up two really polarizing issues with the, the Mauna Loa telescope. Mauna Kea. Oh, excuse me, Mauna Kea telescope, and the, um, what was the other example? Oh, GMO. GMOs. <laughs> right, so, um, I mean, it seems so far apart. How do you how do you propose actually uniting this disparate viewpoint? You know, um, there's a difference between popular movements and what the leadership of communities are, are thinking. And uh, in in Hawaiian culture, you don't often directly speak against the opinion of someone else in your community. And so, even though, um, for example, I consider it really sad that there's this um, seeming dichotomy between science and culture that's not necessary. Um, it, I also uh, appreciate what Kamana Beamer said uh, at the Hawaii Conservation Conference uh, in Hilo last year, right? He gave a talk. How many people were at the HCC last year? Oh, one. Okay. So at that, wait, did you hear Kamana Beamer talk? It was, uh, it was a good plenary. And he talked about issues like this. And he talked about how each person inherits the issues of the generations before. And that if you go back enough generations, you take those issues all the way back to the overthrow of the Hawaiian kingdom, all of the changes that took place in land use and in statehood and you know, all of those kinds of things leading forward to today. And it's very difficult to, to push your way through a lot of that, a lot of those inherited issues to deal rationally with, with um, with the problems that you that you face, so 
He recognized that, for example, Suzanne Case, who was present at that, at that conference, as the head of the Department of Land and Natural Resources, had certain responsibilities that she needed to deal with. Um, and, that, and that the Hawaiian community, having inherited many, many of those issues, um, one, also, one related to the abuse of sacred sites over the whole course of history, um, also carried with them um, things that they needed, they felt they needed to do as well. So I thought that that was a, a remarkably interesting way to, to visualize how that so, uh, social um, context works. Uh, when, when I sat uh, at a recent uh, conference, there were folks from OHA there, there was Dave Lasner from, from you know, the head of this, uh, of this university uh, and others, and we actually sat around lunches and dinners talking about the Mauna Kea issue. So we had Hawaiian leaders uh, and the head of, of UH talking about, about this and, and, and exploring what the particular issues were. Uh, so it's not a matter of, you know, never are they, the twain going to, going to meet. Um, I think it will be, if you could take, turn back the hands of time, which is always the case, there's always a way to do things right and there are thousands of ways to do things wrong. And it's hard to undo when, when major mistakes are made, right? Um, that memory is like, it, it, it lasts for, until that generation has died, right? And if the generation is good at orally transmitting that to the current generation, then it's going to last until that generation dies. So, so it's, it's one of those kinds of things. GMO is the same way. GMO is an extremely complex um, situation. I mean, you probably don't realize, or many people don't realize, that almost all the vaccinations that we've received you know, against many childhood diseases and other diseases for traveling internationally or genetically modified, or the result of genetically modified um, organisms. So we owe our lives to, to GMO, or at least our resistance to disease. Um, similarly, there are many crops that would, I mean, right now there's a, you know, who was it that was telling me that 25% of India is now um, in a major drought uh, stress situation? Drought, of course, is always related to famine, and famine is always related to what you can and cannot grow under certain moisture conditions. And GMO is all about pushing the limits of what can grow in extreme, in extreme conditions. So, and yet, what we seem to have glommed onto in Hawaii is that GMO equals pesticides equals bad, uh, or GMO equals uh, large ag equals bad. So. We need to get beyond that and really look at what the pros and cons of GMO are. And um, the United Nations FAO, Food and Agriculture Organization, had a beautiful site that had on one page all the benefits of GMO that were discussed, and on another page all of the all of the um, what's the word contraindications for GMO. And uh, they were it was fascinating. Uh, everything from uh, contamination of related uh, species of native plants in a particular area, uh, all the way to explorations of whether or not there are nutritional problems or other, or other difficulties. And, and in fact, overuse of pesticides was one of the issues that they pointed out you know, um, in, in, certain, in certain cases. So um, there was at least a start of a balanced approach in, in that situation. Uh, you had a hand up. In some, I was just going to say, in some cases, GMO is related to because they want to use, use new pesticides so they want the plants to be resistant to it. Yeah, that was, that's, it, uh, that's essentially true, but that is not the entire universe of GMO, right? That's, uh, and that's the thing that is often not covered at all in, in media or any of the arguments that are, that are put forward. I have a question. So you mentioned that <coughs> Western or Western Hawaiian people are Um, there are already really good examples of that. The question was, um, one can look at the, the differences between them and the schism that seems to exist, but one can also look at where those things are being combined. And, uh, and one of them, interestingly enough, is in fisheries. So uh, in Molokai, for example, um, scientists interested in the breeding behavior of certain food fish have been working with Molokai fishers who have already a very good feel for exactly when uh, fish are spawning, how that 
how that varies over the year. And in turn, um, those Molokai fishers are taking advantage of the best of the best ways to measure um, measure, for example, gonadal size in fish as they catch them, and feed back into the science into the science of of the biology of those things. And together, um, they are both able to hone um, the practical fishing calendar that is that is being used in on the island of Molokai. So it's a real interesting um, cooperative venture there. On um, in Kona, on the island of Hawaii, the Kaupulehu community. Um, has taken the olelo no eao approach to heart, and they send out folks to observe at land and sea um, over the course of the year what things are blooming, what things are spawning, when things come into maturity um, in both situations, um, have taken all of the olelo no eao that they can uh, for that particular place, map them in a, in a circular calendar that you, where you can turn the, the circles according to um, to date and breeding cycles, so that you can actually say, oh, this year, this is blooming much earlier. So you shift that whole thing over, and you know that they're gonna be blooming for five months or, or whatever. And so instead of starting in July and ending in a certain time, it started you know, it started in April, and it's going to probably end early as well. So it, it's, a, it's a fascinating um, attempt to take traditional knowledge, put it into a emergent, emergent way to depict the world and predict uh, behaviors of ecological services um, there. And it means that you don't just go to the old Olelo no Eao and depend on them and, and, and presume that they're always going to be true. Uh, it's an evolution of, of Hawaiian science methods um, borrowing from the best of adaptive management.